Well, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to Kensington Temple. Uh, my name is Bruce Atkinson. I'm the Associate Minister of Kensington Temple. I'd like to greet you on behalf of our Senior Minister, Colin Dye, uh, who is unable to be with us tonight due to a long-standing international engagement, but he was certainly absolutely delighted to be able to host this evening's event. I'd also like to welcome all of those from around the world that are joining us live. We are uh, streaming this live on our website and uh, we would ask you not to use any recording uh, gear here this evening. Uh, we will be making this available for people to see uh, later on as well as making it uh, live tonight. So welcome to all of you that are joining us right now. Well, we're going to move uh, straight ahead and I'm going to introduce to you tonight our moderator for this evening who will take us for Dr. Solomon Osagi. Thank you and um, good evening and welcome to you ladies and gentlemen. Um, my task this evening is an easier one um, and uh, yours is a bigger one than mine as members of the audience. Before we uh, proceed, I'd like to sort of share with you some of the rules of this evening's uh, engagement. Um, if you don't mind, don't heckle or shout at the speakers. Uh, you can appreciate them if you want to, but keep it till the end so that you don't eat into their allotted time. And the second role that you have to play here this evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that as you walked in through the doors, you would have been handed a slip of paper and if you haven't got one, if you put your hands up now, the stewards walking through the auditorium will hand one of them to you. Um, at some point during this evening's proceedings, there will be a short interval. And um, at that time, you'll have the opportunity to hand in questions that you can uh, present to the speakers um, before we get to the end of the evening's proceedings. So. For this evening's uh, performance, we are relying on the Chatham rules, which means that the speakers are able to say anything they want in the confidence that it's not going to be held against them and it's not going to be recorded and used against them at some point. So if we could bear that in mind. Um, those are the rules. Uh, I, I will sort of talk you through how the, how the evening's uh, schedule will, will proceed. There are, as you see, two speakers there. They will each have an opportunity to speak for 20 minutes, and then there'll be 15 minutes of dialogue and discussion between both of them. Five minutes for each speaker to then summarize their presentations, and then there'll be an interval for you members of the audience to put your questions through to the speakers. Those are the things that I need to share with you this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's speakers. Standing and so sitting there to my left is Professor James White, who is the director of Alpha and Omega Ministries. Um, Professor White has taught Greek and semantic theology. He has authored some 24 books. Um, he is an accomplished speaker and debater around the world and has passed, talked, preached in a number of churches, including Kensington Temple here. His opponent um, is Abdullah al-Andalusi, an international speaker, a thinker, and an intellectual for Islam and Muslim affairs. Um, Mr. Andalusi um, talks a lot about Islamic issues and has opinions from classical scholars and um, Islamic schools of thought. He is of Portuguese, French, colonial African descent, which is a bit of a mouthful, but I've managed to say it. And he has delivered talks internationally. And these are your speakers for this evening. So gentlemen, if you're ready, audience, if you're ready, um, the debate will, will commence. Thank you. James, you have 20 minutes. 
and the topic for this evening's debate is War and Peace in Christianity and Islam. And first of all, it is an honor to be with you again here at Kensington Temple this evening. It was only last uh, May uh, that we were here uh, together. And uh, yes, I do have more than one bow tie and uh, actually have an entire collection. And uh, yes, they do make more than just one style of bow tie. So I am still trying to get the obviously not doing well in getting this uh, fashion trend going, but I will keep trying uh, my best uh, to, to, to do that. This evening, we have... Uh, this evening, if you are here, this evening, if you are here, you have the greatest job to do. This is not a formal debate like we had last time in the sense that we have a thesis that we're debating. Uh, Abdullah and I have debated in the past, uh, and so if we were debating, say, I just did a debate in South Africa on uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. Muslims and Christians have different views on that subject, and therefore, uh, we could do a debate, was Jesus Christ crucified or something along those lines. Instead, we have a dialogue, and the dialogue means that the, the weight of, of the evening is upon you in the audience. Because what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, passages in the Bible that are difficult to understand. They speak of war and they speak of violence. And I'm going to address those texts and attempt to present to you a consistent way of understanding them in light of the fact that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. So why is it that there are such things as the Battle of Armageddon? Why is it that we have uh, the destruction of the Amorites? How can we understand these things in a consistent fashion? And then Abdullah and I are going to have 15 minutes of conversation as to whether I have presented a consistent understanding of these things from the text of Scripture, make some closing comments, and then Abdullah is going to present uh, 20 minutes where he is going to discuss texts in the Quran. We're going to have 15 minutes to talk back and forth, and then some closing statements and make some personal applications. What that means is what we want to have happen this evening is for the conversation to continue amongst you especially if we have uh, some Muslim friends with us this evening. It would be wonderful if what would happen is after this evening is over, if the conversation would continue concerning this very, very important issue. Because we know, of course, few topics require more in-depth thought and consideration than that of war and peace today in our world. Uh, even this day, there have been headlines, there have been reports of violence throughout the world. and. We always ask ourselves the question, how can this be stopped? What is the mechanism whereby it can be stopped? Who is bringing this violence into the world? What are their motivations? And of course, the issue of religion is very, very central to the issue today. The violence currently sweeping across the globe requires truly believing Christians and Muslims to discuss these issues honestly and openly. Now, obviously, uh, there are many people who would say, well, it's, it's almost all Islamic violence. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean for it to be Islamic violence? Are there not differing viewpoints amongst Muslims on these things, just as there are differing viewpoints amongst Christians as well? Well, that's what we're here this evening to find out. I want you to listen carefully to what Abdullah has to say, but my job is first and foremost to talk about some of the texts of Scripture that we have to answer. Because very frequently, if we're going to point the, ping the finger towards someone else, there's always three pointing back toward you. And so if we're going to be consistent, we need to recognize that there are texts in the Bible that require an understanding. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 2, we read these words. Yahweh our God delivered him over to us, and we defeated him with his sons and all his people. So we captured all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men, women, and children of every city. We left no survivor. We took only the animals as our booty and the spoil of the cities which we had captured. From Aurora, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, and from the city which is in the valley, even to Gilead, there was no city that was too high for us. Yahweh our God delivered all over to us. Now, there are many Christians who are embarrassed by texts such as this that speak of the destructions of cities and, as it says, utterly destroyed the men, women, and children of every city. And I know some people try to say, well, that's just a, a form of exaggeration. It just it simply means that there was complete victory in those instances. I, I don't think that's what the text is saying. Uh, God was very clear in the 
commands that he gave to the people of Israel as they were going into the land as to what they were to do, because if they did not obey what God said, because they were being used as the instruments of his judgment, then the people left over would become a snare to them and drag them into idolatry. And oh yeah, that's what the rest of the Old Testament says actually took place. That's exactly what ended up taking place. But here is a text that speaks of warfare and Violence in Deuteronomy chapter 20. Only in the cities of these peoples that Yahweh your God has given you as an inheritance, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes, but you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite and the Amorite, the Canaanite and the Perizzite, the Hivite and the Jebusite, as Yahweh your God has commanded you, so that they may not teach you to do according to all their detestable things, which they have done for their gods, so that you would sin against Yahweh your God. And so here is a difficult concept for people to understand that it was so important that this covenant people, this people that God had chosen to be his people, needed to make sure that they would not be in a situation where they would be drawn into idolatry and the worship of false gods. And in fact, they were being used as a means of judgment. The scriptures tell us that when the people of Israel went down into Egypt, that this cryptic statement is made in Genesis chapter 15, that the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. Now, what does that mean? Well, we know from history that what those people were doing as far as religious worship is concerned was gross idolatry, child sacrifice and, and horrible things. And so God does bring judgment upon them. He doesn't do so in a naturalistic sense and uh, fire from heaven or earthquakes or something along those lines. Instead, he uses his people as the mechanism of bringing judgment upon those sinful nations, and it is a complete judgment here in Deuteronomy chapter 20. But is that all there is to this? Well, in Numbers we read, So Israel made a vow to Yahweh and said, If you will indeed deliver the people in my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. Yahweh heard the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. Then they utterly destroyed them and their cities. Thus the name of the place was called Hormah. And so we have further utter destruction of cities and peoples here recorded in Numbers chapter 21. In 1 Samuel 15, now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. This, is, this is, even extends beyond uh, the people to the actual animals. Now, I could at this point take time to say, well... Sadly, when you look at Canaanite religion, there might have been a biological reason for this, but the issue is utter destruction. It is removing from the land those individuals who are under the wrath of God, and God is using his people to do that. Now, normally what happens is when we discuss this, we stay with the Old Testament. And at this point we can say, well, we can put all of this under the category of God placing his people in the land, the destruction of the exceedingly evil nations before him, and then just sort of stop there because we all know the New Testament is just a wonderful uh, book where there isn't any type of thing we'd have to worry about, right? Well, not exactly. In one of Jesus' parables, in talking about those who are opposing uh, the king, but these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. And many would say that this actually represents uh, Jesus. How could that fit with the, the Lamb of God, with the one who carries little lambs? That's what we, see. we see pictures of it anyways. That must be what the New Testament teaches, right? And yet here you have this idea of rebels enemies of mine, that would mean enemies of God, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. There seems to be the idea that those who rebel against God, just as the Amorites had done, just as the Canaanites had done in their idolatrous worship, that seems to still be the case in the New Testament as well. And then in the book of Revelation, the very end of the New Testament, we read, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sounded is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. 
From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Here in judgment, Jesus Christ comes. And in fact, I didn't put it in my, in my presentation, but I cannot help but think of the other text in the book of Revelation where men call upon the mountains to fall upon them, the rocks to hide them. From what? From God and from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb. That is an amazing phrase. But it does point us toward an understanding, I think, a consistent understanding of what the Scriptures are saying. Now, we need to keep in mind, the Bible is more than seven times longer than the Quran covering 68 times the number of years of human history and cultural development. That's a long, long time. There is a clear development in the Bible from the formation of the people through whom the Messiah would come, that is Israel, to the covenantal constitution of the nation of Israel at Sinai and the giving of the law. What I mean by covenantal constitution, the giving of the law, which identifies the covenants going to exist, to the establishment of Israel in the land and the driving out of the nations under God's judgment, to the regular cycle of revival, apathy, apostasy, judgment, restoration, seen from the judges through the monarchy to the period of the prophets. Jeremiah, however, prophesies of a new covenant that would be established, and this is accomplished through the work of the Messiah, Jesus. This new covenant that is not like the old, it does not establish a nation, a theocracy, it establishes the kingdom all over the world. The biblical message is focused upon the cross as the center point of history. Everything that came before it points to it. Everything that comes after it points back to it. From the Christian perspective, the cross is the very center point of history. By the blood of the cross, Christ establishes the new covenant, and all those who are in that new covenant have peace with God. As Romans 5, 1 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When the prophet prophesied the coming of Christ, how did he describe him? He described him as the Prince of Peace, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so the point of the, the biblical narrative is to focus upon the cross, the blood of the cross that Christ gives voluntarily establishes this new covenant. The new covenant then encompasses the entirety of God's purpose in the establishment of the kingdom of God all the way up to Christ's second coming. Now, the new covenant contains no provisions for military conquest, for the growth of the kingdom is spiritual, not physical. The kingdom exists within the hearts of those that bow the knee in obedience to the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's why that kingdom can cross every boundary. That kingdom can exist in every language, in every nation. That's why we have brothers and sisters this evening in North Korea. Oh, they suffer and we need to pray for them. But we have brothers and sisters this evening under horrific oppression because it's not the governmental system that can constrain the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is brought about by the work of the Spirit of God who takes out that heart of stone, gives a heart of flesh, and that work cannot be constrained by any political considerations whatsoever. The growth of the kingdom is spiritual. Every believer in this room that bows the knee to Jesus Christ is already subject to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is established among men, not politically or militarily, but through the radical transformation of regeneration prophesied long ago by Ezekiel. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances, Ezekiel chapter 36. And so when the spirit of God comes, he changes that heart 
That heart of stone, which was in rebellion against God, becomes a heart of flesh, which loves God. And when the Spirit of God comes, He causes us to walk in His statutes. He, he writes upon our hearts His law. So instead of it being something that's burdensome and difficult and repulsive, it becomes something we love. We love to do what God commands us to do because we love Him and He has loved us. This becomes the motivation of Christian activity. This becomes the motivation of how we are to love one another and how we are to treat our neighbor in such a way that we demonstrate that love to them as well. The Christian message is focused upon the peace the triune God has established by his own action. God reconciles, God cures, God heals his creation to his own glory. Therefore, it needs to be understood, there is no basis in the Christian faith for crusaderism or any form of religious militancy. Such fundamentally misunderstands the nature of conversion and the nature of the kingdom of God, which is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, as Paul says in Romans chapter 14. In other words, my friends, the only power that has been given to the Christian church, and this was God's intention from the beginning. You say, well, how, how is that related to driving the Amorites out? Well, that was, an, that was a demonstration of God's holy wrath against sin, it established the people in the land from whom the, the Messiah would come. But God's intention was always to bring that Messiah, was always to establish this way of salvation, and then to bless all the nations. Go back to Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 12. The promise to Abraham, a blessing to all the nations through his seed, through the promise that would be given to him, and that is through the Messiah and his work. And so now we see the completion of that. The, the prophecy was that he would see his offspring and would rejoice. Well, where is offspring tonight? We're right here. The people of God gathered in this place, far, far away from where these events took place. This is the clear demonstration that God is accomplishing his purpose. Jesus said he'd build his church. The kingdom of God is being established in all of us who follow him. So the only power that has been given to the church is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God that makes that to come alive in people's hearts. Now, some people say, well, preaching the gospel isn't enough. Well, it depends on whether you believe the gospel is the power of God and the salvation or not. We don't need weapons of mass destruction. We need ma weapons of mass instruction, instruction in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because weapons of mass destruction may wipe out physical bodies, but they can never change hearts. Simply fearing mass destruction will not change a heart. But having that heart changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ changes that person forever. And so you see, the church needs to have confidence. The church needs to grow in the confidence of the great gift that has been given to her in that powerful gospel. And that's why we have to be so careful about what the gospel is, about protecting the purity of the gospel, because it is the one power that has been given to God's people. And so when we talk of these texts of violence, what I'm saying is this. Yes, there was violence. There was warfare. There was judgment. But all of it was leading to God's purpose in presenting the kingdom of God through the work of the Messiah. And the message we have now today is if you do not want to experience the wrath of God justly expressed against your sin, there is only one way for that to happen, and that is in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And so we have a whole narrative. We do not reject the fact that there are texts in the Old Testament where God did these things. What we say is no person could look at what the Scriptures say as a whole and say, we need to continue doing that today. We need to have some more, we need to identify some more people as Amorites and go get them. That would be a fundamental rejection of any meaningful means of interpreting the Bible, interpreting it as a whole. And that's our issue this evening. Can we present a meaningful message whereby we look, honestly deal, honestly deal with our text, but can consistently say we as Christians you as Muslims, if we have Muslims with us this evening, are supposed to live in a way that is peaceful, that brings forth peace amongst mankind. That's the issue this evening. There are our texts of violence 
There is an understanding of how they fit in God's purposes. Next, after our conversation, we'll look at the Quran and we'll ask the same questions there. Your job this evening is a tough one. Weigh, listen, consider. I hope you will do so. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, James. That was uh, 20 minutes. And um, gentlemen, you have uh, 15 minutes to have uh, an interactive discussion between both of you. Uh, so that's uh, 15 minutes, and uh, the, the floor is yours. I sort of assumed you would probably sort of take the lead in this section because you may have some questions concerning what I just said. Sure. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to uh, give you a hearty welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you, or Pax Fabiscum, if you're Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> or speak Latin. Yes, or speak Latin. Um, so, um, I mean, today's discussion, I know the post has said a bit of a debate, but I want to, I agree with James, I want to have a bit of a kind of a nuanced discussion and to discuss these issues from perhaps uh, where the root of the matter is. And so my, my questions really are regards to uh, what, what you, uh, may I call you James? Or That's fine. Right? Okay, can we have that up? Um, how would you respond to individuals uh, who cite verses of the Bible in support of their uh, particular, let's say, political projects? So for example, um, certain uh, right-leaning uh, lobbies in the United States of America who support uh, Zionist projects in, 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 in the, obviously, the Levant um, and support Zionism against, let's say, Palestinians and Palestinian rights to right of return and so on and so forth. Uh, citing that this land has been given, given to the people of Israel and so uh, if they have a right to dispossess anyone who's living on that land and take ownership, what kind of argument would you bring um, against those who cite biblical scriptures? Uh, to support well, that's them. an interesting question. Obviously, there are different uh, understandings amongst Christians as to exactly the relationship of uh, the church to the uh, physical nation of Israel. And the majority of uh, people in uh, the nation of Israel today are not actually practicing or believing Jews. There's a, a minority of, of, strong, of strong believing Jews. But uh, that becomes a political issue in regards to um, whether you support democracy or, or issues along those lines. I am concerned when people try to find in the New Testament prophecies of end times events and stuff like that and try to tie them into... Uh, I, I, was, I was raised thinking that the uh, budding of the fig tree meant that Christ had to return before uh, 1988 uh, because it would be one generation after the establishment of Israel, and that was 40 years, and so... 1989 was a bummer, but anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it is interesting to me at this point, um, if we're talking about war and violence, um, I'm not sure what the relationship there is unless what you're thinking is, well, uh, Israel's using war and violence. Of course, there's a lot of war and violence going on over there. It goes both directions. There's missiles going both ways. And I, my, my, my response to anyone would be the only solution for what's going on in Israel, in what's going on in Syria, which is an even greater humanitarian uh, uh, disaster right now, is what I just said. Um, fundamentally, in, at the end of the day, the only way that those things can be changed is by changing hearts. And the only way to do that that I know of is through the gospel. And so, uh, as silly as it sounds to the world, I think the Christian uh, response is the gospel, the gospel, and more of the gospel. Uh, that's the only answer I can possibly give to someone. And if they think that it's this pol political system or that political system, um, political systems come and go. Uh, the gospel stays, stays the same from generation to generation. So, uh, without a specific as to what type of verse they'd be using, it'd be hard to give me a, a more specific response than that. Just that some may justify um, the, so the dispossession of, oh, sorry, some may justify the dispossession of um, Palestinians from their land by citing that um, the God gave the land mm -hmm. to the, the tribes of Israel, and people who are living on that land who are not 
from the tribes of Israel, have no right to that land, and therefore can be legitimately dispossessed from that land and evicted. Uh, so there's some, some obviously, uh, let's say, right-wing, right-leaning groups in the United States have, have cited these verses in support of, of um, uh, dispossessing Palestinians. So my, my point is, because they are citing biblical verses uh, alluding to God granting land to a people, and then and presumably this land hasn't ended, so it's still being granted to them. It's still an eternal you know, grant. What argument could you, could you offer? Because um, changing hearts is one thing, but it's, they, their argument is from the mind, and they argue that they have authority. Um, or well, rather, if, if, if the yeah. argument was that this is a hmm. basis for wanton violence, uh, for, for, for doing what uh, was done to the Amorites, well, not that would violence, be just injustice. I'm sorry. Just injustice, not necessarily. Um, uh, well, that warfare. that gets you into argumentation as to whether Israel has the right to exist as a nation, uh, what the role of the UN was, the, the highly controversial arguments about that, and then there is, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, a a difference amongst Christians as to the role uh, of the physical nation of Israel. Um, there are those who believe that there are promises that are going to be given to that physical nation. There are others that interpret that uh, as specifically fulfilled in uh, the church and the fact that Paul says we are the true circumcision who worship Christ Jesus in spirit and truth so that those are being fulfilled in the church. Uh, so there are different perspectives amongst Christians, and that's a, a whole major area of, uh, of argumentation unto itself. But there's never any basis for a, the Christian people to view the idea that the kingdom of God can be promoted through the utilization of, of military force to try to somehow uh, push forward the, uh, the, the gospel agenda. Again, that's why there are Christian missionaries in Israel as well uh, seeking to spread that gospel there. Okay. I mean, th there's some other things. I, first and foremost, uh, I, I mentioned a few groups, and I don't believe these groups are religious or Christian. Uh, and are waking up in the morning and thinking, what does the Bible tell me to do? <laughs> but what they do uh, do is, for example, in England, we have um, the English Defence League, who, as I, as I spoke to you earlier on, they put as one of their motto, um, um, in, hoc, uh, in hoc signo vinces, in this sign conquer, and the sign of the cross, which was a... Uh, it goes Constantine. back to Constantine. Yeah, Constantine. In 313, yeah. But um, Britain First is another group. Uh, again, I don't claim that these people wake up in the morning, read the Bible, and are acting as what the Bible tells them to do, their first priority at all. They seem to be secular um, nationalists of some kind. However, when uh, they were condemned by Christian groups in the UK, uh, that what they were doing is being very aggressive, they were being violent, they weren't in engendering peace, and their argument was that Jesus claimed or argued that he, wasn't, he, you know, he didn't come to bring peace, but to but bring the a sword. sword. And then they also cited Jesus whipping uh, the moneylenders using, uh, uh, I think, a, a cord of, of yes. whips and so yes. on, out, which is engaging in, in actual violence. Mm -hmm. So they use this to argue their point. And I bring this up not because I think the argument has any merit from a Christian perspective, but I'm just interested to see what your response mm -hmm. so that maybe Christians can understand how they should respond. I actually did a video. Uh, I don't remember which group it was. You'd probably be able to recognize what they, there were people going through a Muslim neighborhood carrying crosses but engaging in swearing wars with the people that they were, while they were carrying yeah, the crosses, first, which, yeah. <laughs> which makes me go, oh, there's some inconsistency. Um, and I, I tried to point out the fact that this was a, a, a tremendous, uh, dis, tremendously disrespectful thing to the cross of Jesus Christ to be carrying it while using foul language in that, in that fashion. But obviously, in the text that you were citing, um, if you're the sinless son of God and you're in the temple fulfilling prophecy, then you can do those things, but they're not the sinless son of God, and they're not in the temple, and they don't have the purity of the motivations that he did. When he cleansed the temple, he was driving people out who had turned the temple into a den of thieves. And so uh, there, there would be a fundamental reason to do that. The temple does not exist any longer in that sense, uh, so that wouldn't make any sense. And the other, uh, the other text, uh, I'm sorry, what was the other text that they... Um... Um, they said that, uh, Jesus, a quote from uh, New Testament, uh, think not that I've come to bring peace. Right, but exactly. Sword, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, that one especially is significant because what Jesus is talking about is the fact that when his gospel will be presented, it's going to divide families. And there are going to be people in a family who will accept his gospel, people in a family who will not. And so it's going to cause division. But that's a division based upon truth. 
not a division based upon engaging in, in physical violence. So the, the war and the peace and the sword and the peace, the sword is the division that takes place in families when one person follows the ways of God and one person does not do so. So both would be grossly out of context to attempt to connect them to some kind of nationalistic political activity where you just simply put a cross on something and, and therefore use it. And that's, that's what offended me the most, was the utilization of the cross as a means of offending somebody else. The cross is offensive, but it's offensive because it speaks to us of our sin and the need of a savior. Uh, it shouldn't be offensive for any other reason, especially when it's associated with political things. Okay. Um, I had some other questions, and these ones are actually purely because of my curiosity. I mean, well, I, well, could I ask, did, did yeah. you, in, in my presentation, did you, uh, does it make sense to you that there is an overarching way of understanding um, the difference between the Old Covenant and the people of Five Israel minutes. and what we have in the New Covenant, and that there's a fundamental difference between the theocratic nation of Israel and now the kingdom of God that, that transcends all political borders and, and the only power we have is the gospel. Does that, does that make, does it, does it at least sound consistent knowing what you know of me? Am I interpreting the Bible in a different way here than when I'm presenting the deity of Christ or something like that? Is there consistency in, in, your, in your mind at that point? What I'll say is that you have an interpretation um, I quite like, obviously, political philosophy. I was telling you earlier on about that. And I, like, look, I, was, I really am fascinated with Christian political philosophy throughout, throughout time, uh, including so Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, and um, St. Augustine. And they had some different ideas about uh, how the Old Testament could be used. So mm -hmm. uh, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching acts of righteousness. Right. Another verse uh, they would cite would be, be imitators of God. So they would cite Old Testament verses, uh, not such, and, they, and, and obviously uh, John Calvin's Institutes of Religion, I think book four is, I think was very fascinating by this. Um, the first time I debated, I, I read book one. I think James White's making me go through all of John Calvin's books, uh, <laughs> uh, Institutes of Religion. Um, interesting, interesting, interesting read. But his argument was that uh, he believed in this kind of um, two kingdom theology idea, which is that the church and, it should not be controlled by the state, and the state should not be controlled by the church, but the state and the church both work together to, uh, to as I quote, to establish religion and uh, to uh, protect religion, protect outward forms of, of, do of doctrine and uh, piety, um, and where the, the church uses persuasion, the state should use coercion. Yep. And this was a, what he viewed as a legitimate interpretation. Now, he didn't make very clear that Christians are not under the, uh, the judicial laws of the Old Testament, but, be, but Christians are more under the, the law of love and the principles contained in the Bible, in, in all, all the Bible, in the Tota Scriptura, uh, that he had an opinion that obviously the church could enforce um, doctrines and, uh, sorry, not church, sorry, right. the, the state could enforce with force doctrines, persecute um, heretics to bring them back into the fold. Which is why I would have been kicked out of Geneva by John Calvin. Mm. No, seriously, I would have. I've, I've said that many, many times. I think, I think one, of the, one of the difficult things people struggle with is I can still have tremendous respect and benefit from his writings, but recognize that had I lived in that day and held the commitments that I have, I would have been banished from Geneva uh, because he was a sacralist. Everybody had been for 1,100 years. It's all they knew. However, he did lay the groundwork for the destruction of sacralism, that is the church-state uh, union and relationship. Um, maybe in the next section we can talk about whether there can be an actual distinction between church and state within Islam in regards to Sharia law and how it's to be established. But you're exactly right. Um, there was in that day the belief uh, that the state had the uh, requirement, and there still are some Christians who believe that what we should work toward is the establishment of a state that would establish uh, the just and righteous use of, of God's law. As a Baptist, my forefathers have suffered at the hands of Christians uh, who took that perspective. And so as, as I look at the overarching teaching of Scripture, uh, I just ask the question, where does the New Testament present to us the idea of establishing a, a Christian governmental system? Uh, the apostles lived under the, under the Caesars, and they taught everyone to try to live peacefully and to pray for those who were in leadership. So we might have pre peace to do what? To live godly lives and preach the gospel. 
Um, so I, I appreciate, I, I appreciate well, your, you, you do recognize that there have been, look, there's a lot of inconsistency in Christian history, uh, but it all, all, all depends on how consistent those Christians were being as far as their interpretation of the Bible itself is concerned. I, mean, I know there's only a few seconds left. Um, uh, I think uh, St. Augustine discussed also uh, d dealing with the state as well in a similar fashion mm -hmm. to, to Calvin. And I suppose the, the citation of Romans 13, where the, the leader is an agent of, of wrath for God and, and, only, and punishes the evildoers, mm -hmm. maybe that was an enabling verse for, for Christianity to go into politics uh, when Christians became the, the leaders and themselves. Right. right. Okay. Thank you, right on cue. And um, James, five minutes uh, to summarize your thoughts from uh, this segment of this discussion. Now, if any of you are disappointed that we haven't gone to fisticuffs yet, <laughs> um, then, that is young. Then, then, then he's young, yes. Uh, and he's much taller than I am, much longer reach. I'm, not even going to try. This evening, you're starting to get the sense of what it is your responsibility is going to be. We were just talking about a consistent interpretation of Scripture, and if you know church history, you can find lots of people in history who have not been consistent in their application of Scripture. Here's what I'm suggesting to you. Every generation is responsible for making the once for all delivered to the saints faith your own. And it's our responsibility as Christians to examine our own theology, our own interpretation, and to ask ourselves the question, do I use the same method of interpretation when I look at the doctrine of the Trinity, when I look at the resurrection, when I look at the atonement, when I look at the church, when I look at the relationship of the church and the state, when I look at those texts of the Old Testament where God's holiness is displayed in His wrath, do I use the same method of interpretation for each one of them, or am I adopting different methods to try to keep myself comfortable? That's the question each one of us has to be asking ourselves, and that can be an uncomfortable question to ask of yourself. But here's why we need to ask it. My friends, when we engage with our Muslim friends on this subject and we say, here is the Christian understanding of how we're to have peace, and there are differences between us, if we haven't thought through our own position, we're going to be in no position to actually engage with them or even to offer criticism of what they have to say. And unfortunately, our two communities rarely talk to each other the way we're talking this evening. I hope you realize you're in an extremely unique setting this evening. In many Muslim countries, this would not be allowed. I would not be allowed in Saudi Arabia to do this kind of thing. In many other countries, it's considered politically incorrect, and sadly, that's coming here as well. How long will we be able to do this? I don't know. I don't know. But as long as we have the opportunity, then we need to take that opportunity and talk to one another and try to understand where each one is coming from. Now, I want you to understand. You might say, I, I, I want more of a head-to-head -head thing. You need to understand something. Abdullah and I had lunch today, and one of the things that we mentioned, my greatest desire for him is that he come to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. His greatest desire for me is that I would say the Shahada and submit to Islam. Okay? Now, we're not compromising. We're not saying that we believe the same things, that we can all just get along and hold hands and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> I've never really liked Kumbaya all that much anyways. <laughs> we're not saying that. We're not pretending that. What we are saying is that we live in a world where there's great, there's great evil and there's great violence. And people of goodwill on both sides of this issue need to stand up and we need to be talking to one another not ignoring one another. And the more our communities understand of one another, the better we can move forward in trying to deal with these tremendous issues that are tearing our societies apart. And so, this evening, when we look at the Scriptures, we dare not deny the reality that there are texts that speak of violence that's taken place in the past, of judgment that's going to be coming in the future. 
But you know where the greatest text of violence was that I didn't read? Acts 4. And the church prayed. They were being persecuted. And they said, speaking of that persecution, that God foreordained the fact that Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Romans, and the Jews would be gathered together against Jesus, the Son of God, and they would put him to death. You want the greatest act of violence? The fact that mankind murdered the only sinless man who's ever lived. Everyone else deserves God's wrath. He took it voluntarily. That's a message that changes hearts. And from the Christian perspective, that's really the focus of why we do what we do and how we understand those texts in the Scripture. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Mr. Allen, Lucy, you have five minutes. Summarize. Do you have a I'd like to thank uh, James White for his wonderful um, discussion and um, providing an interpretation from, from his perspective. And of course, you know, it's his interpretation and an interpretation which is legitimate within Christian schools of thought. I, I was reading and I've engaged a lot with um, Mennonite Christians who are complete pacifists in all manners and all things. In fact, they also are antithetical to government. But identified there are different streams within Christianity concerning uh, warfare, concerning peace, concerning government, and there are ongoing debates uh, right now. Generally, the Anabaptists, or, of which the Mennonites are a branch of, um, are a minority. The mainstream opinion is obviously Christians believe in, or most Christians believe in a type of just war or limited wars. Uh, there are different interpretations in the past where there was from blank check to the ruler uh, to uh, Christians who believe that spreading peace even via offensive warfare, is legitimate as long as your aim is peace, which was in the opinion of um, Augustine in his epistle to Boniface. So there's different opinions, and all I really wanted to show today was, and I, what I have usually done in, in such debates when I've, I've encountered actually Mennonite Christians and I do debates with them, uh, all is that I want to show them is that there are different opinions, and there are opinions which uh, do open the doors to war and open the doors to theonomy and uh, religious government. And in principle, I don't really object to religious government. Uh, so John Calvin has some interesting uh, arguments uh, on theonomy, which I think uh, are very similar to the Islamic perspective on many, many aspects. So perhaps there's some agreement, uh, obviously between John Calvin, not necessarily with, with Islam, it's interesting, but it, that was a very common mentality. But when I bring up these particular points and these issues, and I, I first want to, to illustrate that in today's world, uh, there is and there should be more interaction and cooperation between Muslims and Christians. Uh, we all believe in God, we all love Jesus, and we all affirm that he's the Messiah, which you cannot be a Muslim unless you affirm those things. And I so affirm that Jesus is the Messiah, and that I love Jesus. So I believe in Jesus, but maybe what the differences are in other aspects, such as whether he is God or not. But more importantly, you can have debates, and there are increasing debates between Muslims and Christians in the Muslim world, we can have this debate in Malaysia, in Egypt, although I might want to avoid it because I've criticized President Sisi, but um, uh, Lebanon, we have, my organization, Muslim Debate Initiative, has a branch in Lebanon, so if ever we, both of you, me and you go to Lebanon, uh, we can uh, do a debate over there. Uh, whether I'll be let back in to England or America would be a different question after that. And, and, and Turkey too, so there's many places in the Muslim world, including I think Doha as well. Uh, there's many places in the Muslim world you can do debates. We had the honor and pleasure of inviting uh, James to a debate at East London Mosque, which is one of uh, Europe's largest mosques. We hosted a debate for him, it was very well attended and it was very amicable, and we were very happy uh, with the outcome. Now, just to kind of, uh, I think, finish up my point, um, we need, a Christians to re-examine the ideas of warfare because there are many Christians out there who will cite biblical verses, who will go Old Testament uh, on their, in their political uh, policies, and they will justify many wars uh, around the globe. And I'm not just, people usually always cite the, the, the Crusades, oh sorry, usually cite the Crusades, that was long, long time ago. Uh, the issues that we see, for example, when the United States spread westward and uh, you know, conquered the West, 
Uh, they used the concept of manifest destiny and the idea that the in native Indians were heathens, and this was a new Jerusalem, a new Israel. And they cited these, these doctrines up. And, and again, you know, many Christians today, thankfully, would oppose that, think, condemn it. But we have to get to an understanding as to what is the criteria that Christians can all agree on to condemn these things, uh, to condemn the war in Iraq, uh, to condemn certain groups uh, in the, in, in, throughout the world. For example, in Congo, there's the anti-Balaka movement, which demanded that Muslims uh, convert or die to, to Christianity. So either they convert to Christianity or die. And I know that's not, they didn't open up the Bible, and the Bible didn't tell them to do that. They're not, they're not a re serious religious movement. However, Christians, if, we're going to, if you're going to engage in the world affairs and deal with, these, with policies around the world, you need to have a solid basis by which you can say, this is against the Bible, and anyone who says this is not Christian. Thank you for listening. I'd like to reiterate my greetings to everyone here and uh, thank the, the church for its hospitality and all you for attending to discuss this topic of war and peace in Islam and Christianity. Now, I'm also wanted to thank again my respected interlocutor, uh, James, for attending and giving an edifying discussion on the Christian perspective. Uh, the last platform that me and uh, James uh, spoke on was a debate at uh, Trinity Chapel in London on Trinity Road on the topic of the Trinity. You, I don't think you can get any more Trinities in that unless you move it to Trinidad, perhaps, which is the Spanish uh, word for Trinity, I'm, I've heard. Um, and I'd also like to reiterate that the example of uh, Muslims and Christians uh, discussing and debating was set by uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, when he had a debate with the Christian delegation from uh, an Arab city in Najran in the Arabian Peninsula, where the Christians and Muslims had a debate for but three days, two nights, and not continuously, of course. And at the end of this, the Christians were still unconvinced by the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam's uh, discussion. And what did the Prophet Muhammad uh, do? He offered them uh, the opportunity to pray the Christian prayers in a mosque before going back home, because it was a long journey they had to go back home. So this was the example of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam that Muslims have to adhere to, that Muslims have to follow, and that we hold up to be an exemplar. Now today, in, but certainly in Europe and also I've been hearing in the United States, uh, Christians and Muslims face a very uh, common challenge, which is from uh, secularism and secular liberalism, and sometimes it's more referred to as uh, militant secularism, and the intolerance and also the straw manning of se that secularism or secular secularists do against religion, portraying religion as a cause of war, as a cause of violence, and secular liberalism as the only solution or pathway towards peace. Now, I'm, I'm going to be engaging that as well in this discussion, but I first want to discuss the concept of peace and war in Islam. Now, before we discuss war, we must, we must first discuss peace and what it looks like. The Quran illustrates this, and it's a very personal definition. When, it, when we believe, God says in the Quran, those who believe and find tatma'inu, which means peace or assurance or contentment, in the remembrance of God, for without doubt, in the remembrance of God, do hearts find peace. So, in remembering God is where you find peace, it's where you find assurance, it's where hearts find contentment. We also see in another verse, a reassured soul, return to your Lord, well pleased and pleasing to him. In another verse in the Quran, so the Prophet Muhammad is instructed to say, sufficient for me is God, there is no deity except him, on him I have relied, and he is the Lord of the great throne. The Prophet Muhammad also taught, true richness is not via much property and belongings, but true richness is self-contentment. It's this assuredness, this peace in the heart. But we also see that the Quran discusses other kinds of peace. The peace that you get with your family, with your spouse, that the peace that the spouse the, the husband and the wife provide to each other. And at the bottom, we see a chronic verse talking about the peace of living securely in a land, safe from persecution and safe from oppression. 
Now, in order to understand Islam, we must understand Islam's mission to humanity. So in the Quran, we believe God says, and thus we made you, referring to the Muslims, a just community that you will be witnesses over the people and the messenger will be a witness over you. So as Muslims, we are commanded, we believe by God, to be witnesses to mankind. We also see in another verse of the Quran, O oh, you who believe, be upholders of justice, bearing witness for God alone, even against yourselves or your parents and relatives, whether they are rich or poor, God is well able to look after them. Do not follow your own desires and deviate from the truth. If you twist or turn away, God is aware of what you do. In another verse in the Quran, we believe God says, God commands justice and fair dealing. We believe that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught those who are merciful will be shown mercy by the merciful. Be merciful to the people of the earth and the one above the heavens will have mercy upon you. Which is very reminiscent of uh, verses I've found in the New Testament in the book of James as well as the parable of the king and the, uh, the servant who had a debt. Show mercy and you'll be shown mercy. And that we should be merciful to each other. We also see another verse in the Quran, which said, so another uh, narration of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, which said, the son of Adam, which means all mankind, has no better right than that he would have a house wherein he may live, a piece of clothing whereby he may hide his nakedness, and a piece of bread and some water. And the reason why I mention this, the son of Adam, the rights of the son of Adam, because Islam believes in universal rights for human beings that all people from, who are the sons and daughters of Adam deserve around the world, of which Muslims have to strive to ensure that everyone attains these rights and has their rights secure. Now, I'm going to go into the Quran to discuss the Quranic concept of war and how we can understand it. But first of all, I think there should be prerequisites that we all need to have before understanding the Quran from a non-Semitic background. Uh, anyone who's familiar, familiar with Semitic languages will understand the use of idiom, uh, the use of uh, hyperbole at times, of ellipsis, there's wonderful rhetorical devices and the uses of word. And I think that when we understand the Quran, we have to understand the Quran not as a literature written in Greek or Latin or written as prose, but as written in the literary genre of what it is. Now, some people um, often remark that the Quran it's certainly not similar in its narrative style to what the book you call the Bible, but it's very similar to the narrative, to the style of speaking in the Psalms, where God is uh, directly speaking. If you want to compare something to the Bible within Islam, we have a, something which we, we view as comparable in terms of its style, its narration, narrative style, which we call the Sira literature. And Sira is basically the biography of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, written by uh, biographers. We don't hold it to be the same standard as the Bible in terms of it being the, the ineffable or in, uh, infallible word of God. However, we do hold it to be a narrative style that informs us of the context and the historical situations that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, lived and worked in. Now, people have often remarked about the Quranic literary style. It's unique in the Arabic language. It doesn't conform to poetry or prose or any uh, known rhymed prose. But despite this, one of the signs that the Quran advances for itself is that it describes itself as mubin. And mubin means a clarity of speech that is like the level of prose, but and not like psychobabble. Because at the time the Prophet Muhammad saw something, there were people called kahanin who would uh, make very flowery language and very flowery compositions using uh, styles of, of, uh, of text, similar rhyming, rhymed prose and so on and so forth, called saja in, in the Arabic language. And, but in order to, to keep this rhymed prose going, they had to make gobbledygook the text. They couldn't maintain a, a text that sounds like prose. It sounded like gobbledygook. It sounded like psychobabble. And I'll just give you an example of psychobabble. Souls must transcend like cranes and ascend on clouds of thought to unite with all dimensions to the oneness of existence. I actually just made it up. I wrote that, and it means nothing. <laughs> but it sounds nice. <laughs> psychobabble, flowery language. So the Quran is mobin in that it's not psychobabble. It reads like prose in terms of how it conveys information, but its style is not like prose in terms of the, its literary genre.
But I think very importantly, people have to understand that the Quran uses uh, polysemony. And I'll give an example of this from a very famous example. The word, the word in the Quran for uh, usually translated as disbelievers, kafir, singular, plural, kufar. It lit, now in Arabic, the word kafir or kufar literally translates as someone who covers. In Hebrew, it's kofa, and it sounds quite similar to the English cover, in fact. So it literally means someone who covers. And this exact same word is used throughout the Quran, but it has different meanings depending on where it's used and how it's used. And, and I'll give you some very obvious ones. So in Surah or, or Quranic chapter 57, verse 20, it refers to farmers. Farmers are kufar. It doesn't mean they are disbelievers who are who are going to suffer perdition in the hereafter, it means they are coverers of the seeds. And so it's a word that means farmer in that context. In Quran 6, in chapter 60, verse 5, it refers to a generic word for people who come from societies who are uh, not believing revelation or non-believers uh, in Islam. But in other verses, for example, in Surah 60, chapter, uh, verse 10, it refers to uh, pagans and polytheists and even though the word kufar is used and it says that we're not allowed to marry people who are not believers in monotheism kufar but in surah 5 ayah 5 it says we are allowed to marry people of the book christians and jews so if christians are jews if the word kufar is always consistent and always going to be meant in the way of disbeliever then wouldn't the quran be contradicting itself by saying you can't get married to kufar, but you can get married to Jews and Christians. So the Quran uses it in different ways. Also, the Quran uses the word kufar to mean eschatological disbelievers. And it's a, I know it's a bit of a mouthful. What it means is that on the day of judgment, these people will be proven and shown to be those who have rejected the truth. They have rejected the truth in their hearts. And it's very hard to know who truly is a believer in anything and who truly is a, is a disbeliever in anything. And on the day of judgment, we'll find out for many things. But here is a verse in the Quran, Verily those who disbelieve, it is the same to them whether you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. Now if the word uh, kufar in this means all non-Muslims, then there's no point inviting people to Islam because if, that's, if kufar in this verse means all non-Muslims, then that means there's no point in inviting to Islam because no one will ever accept Islam. Wouldn't make any sense. But it does make sense if you understand that the Quran is referring to uh, a particular meaning with regards to those who are in their hearts, and God knows who they are, they are the rejectors of truth, they are insincere individuals. And this also brings me to something very pertinent to this discussion coming up, which we call harbi uh, non-Muslims, those who are at war or physically hostile to Muslims and Islam, physically hostile, those who engage in acts of war, fighting, and uh, per persecution. So we see in Surah 66, Ayah 9, that it refers to this, and I'm going to, I quoted it in the bottom there, and people usually quote this text out of context, thinking it refers to all people who are non-Muslim, but it's not. It refers to those who are at war with Islam, uh, at war with Muslims, physical war. O Prophet, strive against the kuffar and the hypocrites and be harsh upon them, and their refuge is hell, and wretched is, their, is the destination. If it's referring to all non-Muslims, then again, why would the Prophet Muhammad and, Islam, and Muslims try to invite people who are non-Muslim who are all going to go to hell anyway. What's the point? Well, it only makes sense if you understand that it's only referring to a particular people and not non-Muslims. The Quran wouldn't make sense if you try to say that every time it uses uh, a word that has polysemy, polysemy um, uh, concepts to it that it's meaning the same meaning in every case. Now, a very, very brief history of the Prophet Muhammad uh, It began with revelation when he was 40. Uh, he began open preaching in his city in Mecca. Uh, almost instantly, the Muslims faced persecution. Muslims were tortured, were killed. Rocks were put on them. The first martyr in Islam was Samaya. She had a spear put right through her belly because she believed in Islam. And this, this was, there was a lot of heavy persecution by uh, the polytheists. Uh, after a time, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was offered leadership by two tribes of Medina, a neighboring city, it was called Yathrib at the time, but they offered him leadership, and he uh, left, and he left just as, as he was going to be caught and executed by the, the, um, the Qurayshiites. And uh, obviously wars be happened between Mecca and Medina during this time. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, called for a truce and sent emissaries uh, around the region, 
And then one emissary was executed by the Hassanids, which was a Roman client, and the Romans threatened invasion of Arabia. Uh, the pagans broke their truce and started to kill Muslims. And this is where we see that the, the Prophet Muhammad began a campaign to end the pagan tribal domination of Arabia. But it is, we must note that during this time, Jews and the, the Christians of Najran and the Zoroastrians were not evicted by the Prophet Muhammad from Arabia. And we see that after he passed away, uh, his companions uh, took over as political leadership and they fought the regional superpowers who were uh, oppressing the, the regions adjacent to Arabia, the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire, or the Byzantines as we anachronistically call them. So what is Islam's commands to Muslims regarding non-Muslims? Well, all these verses come from chapter six and it begins from Ayah five, this, this quotation. Our Lord, so it's, it's, it's referring to Muslims here, our Lord made, make us not objects of torment for the non-believers and forgive us, our Lord, indeed it is you who are exalted in might and wise. We see in a, a verse that was con in continuing, perhaps God will, between you and those to whom have been your enemies, uh, uh, among them put affection and God is competent and God is forgiving and merciful. God does not forbid you from those who do not fight you because of your religion and do not expel you from your homes from being righteous towards them and acting justly towards them. Indeed, God loves those who act justly. God only forbids you from those who fight you because of your religion and expel you from your homes and aid in your expulsion, forbids that you make allies of them and whoever makes allies of them, then it is those who are the wrongdoers. And I think that expresses it quite succinctly in a surah. Islam rejects coercion. The famous verse that cited there should be no compulsion in religion. Truth is clear from falsehood. In a, but there's another verse that's more interesting in terms of the bigger picture. And that is, there's a verse uh, in Surah 10, verses 99 to 100. And had your Lord so willed, all those on earth would have believed all of them in their entirety. Then would you compel the people in order that they become believers? It is not for a soul to believe except by the permission of God, and he will place defilement upon those who will not use reason. And this is very interesting because it, it's saying to Muslims that God intended that not everyone on this earth will be following all one religion. The fact that there's different religions is intended by God. So if it's intended by God, who are any of us to compel anyone to change their faith? It is only by God that people are guided and by God that people um, are not guided. Something which I think um, Calvinists would probably agree with <laughs> to an extent. But also, we see that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gave covenants to Christians, for example, the community of Najran, and said Najran and its people enjoy protection from God and the Prophet Muhammad for themselves, their religion, land, and wealth. He also says a command to, to Muslims and how to treat non-Muslim citizens. So whoever oppresses an, a Muahid, a non-Muslim citizen, or imposes upon him more than he can afford and humiliates him or takes anything from him without his consent, I will challenge him on the day of judgment. This is what the stern warning that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has uh, said to Muslims. The Prophet Muhammad also said, whoever has harmed a non-Muslim citizen has harmed me. Uh, again, a very stern warning to Muslims not to harm people who do not want to be Muslim and reside within Muslim lands. And uh, we also see a narration at the bottom there where there were non-Muslims who, if they could not afford uh, to, to be a citizen, usually the males, and they couldn't afford to pay the military waiver tax, a uh, long story, Muslim males are obliged to be reservists Non-Muslim males are not obliged to be reservists in the army, instead they pay a waiver tax. Um, if they can't afford it and they are poor or ill, then they are to be given money, they are to be given welfare from the Islamic government's treasury. So Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians are to be given welfare if they are poor, weak or ill uh, and so on. We also see that, the prophet, that in the Quran it says, and fight them until there is no fitna, which is persecution or oppression, and until the religion, all of it is for God, and if they cease, then indeed God is seeing of what they do. And this is frequently miscited by many uh, individuals who want to criticize Islam. But we see from a commentary of this by a classical Islamic scholar, Ibn Kathir, he said uh, in this discussion, he quoted Ibn Umar saying, 
We did that during the time of the messenger of God when Islam was weak and the man would be tried in his religion, either tormented to death or being imprisoned. When Islam became stronger and widespread, there was no more fitna, there was no more oppression and persecution. So what the commentators have said is that fight people if they persecute people for their faith until there is no persecution and it is only God who decides who is guided or not, not people torturing or um, coercing. But also in the Quran it says that um, Islam orders Muslims to fight against militant aggressors, those who fight them, and, but it also says that those who, fight, who are fighting you, you're not allowed to transgress against them even if they are fighting you. And that imposes a limit by which many um, uh, narrations by the Prophet Muhammad have said that civilians cannot be targeted in war even if there's an enemy that's targeting your civilians, you cannot retaliate in like manner. So just to kind of uh, summarize, there are, uh, there are two general discussions about how Muslims dealt with, the, dealt with pagan Arabs and Romans, and we'll discuss this in the Q&A, but suffice to say, Muslims are only commanded to fight when they're being persecuted, to rescue others from oppression, and to ensure that the only one who decides whether anyone is guided or not is God, and not the whip or the lash by human hands. Thank you for listening. Uh, gentlemen, uh, 15 minutes, and it's again uh, the dialogue between both of you. Thank you. All right, now, Abdullah, you had to skip over the most important part. <laughs> well, we can discuss it here. Yeah, uh, okay, and, and make sure you get into that microphone so everybody can hear you. Um, all right, everybody in this audience, let's, 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 let's make sure we cover, if we don't cover this and cover it thoroughly, we're gonna be accused of having soft pedaled the whole thing, so we, mm. need, we need to dig into this. Um, the most often cited set of verses in this subject that I'm sure all the Christians in the audience need to hear from you about. You started to get into the context of Surah 9. You didn't have a chance to do, do so. You had to skip over it. Surah 9, 29 and 30. Let me, let me read it unless you want have a different translation, but fight against those who do not believe in a law or in the last day, who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful and who do not adopt the religion of truth, that is Islam, from those who were given the scripture. I looked at the Arabic, and that's the al kitab this is, this is Jews and Christians. Fight until they give the jizya willingly and feel themselves to be humbled. Now, my, the, the thing that concerns me and I need to hear from you on is the very next verse. I, under, I understand that someone can say, well, verse 29 was in a particular uh, context, a particular situation in that day that is not repeated today, et cetera, et cetera, even though, if I recall correctly, please correct me, I think Umar ibn Affan used Surah 929 when he did finally expel uh, uh, Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula. I could be wrong about that, but I think he did. But here's what's concerning to me. The Jews say, and this is the very next verse, the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. That is their statement from their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who, and the root is kafir, uh, disbelieved before them. May Allah destroy them. How are they deluded? So here's my question. I understand that, that many want to say that 929 is temporally limited to a particular period of time. How is 930 related to 929 contextually? Okay. Because it, 930 is a, a pretty strong verse, and it doesn't seem to have a temporal uh, application to it. Okay. Well, it was a good question, and I wanted to get through it um, in my presentation, but time uh, cut me out. So you have to understand that up until this point in, in Islamic history, the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, and his companions uh, they had actually been supporting the Romans against the Persian Empire, not directly supporting, but morally supporting them. So we see a verse in the Quran which mentions uh, Surah 30, one, uh, Ayahs 1 to 5, which says, the, the Romans have been defeated in the nearest land, but they, after their defeat, will overcome within three to nine years. To God belongs the command before and after, and the day, the belie that day the believers will rejoice. And that was because the, the pagan Arabs would say, we are going to beat you like the Persians, our fellow polytheistic kin, beat the monotheistic Christians. 
and the Muslims would be morally supporting the Christians, the, the Romans against uh, the, the, uh, the, the Persians. So you had the situation, but then when you found that a, a, a emissary of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was executed by a Roman client, the Hassanids, and then you had concerns that the Roman army was advancing into Arabia, and the Muslim army went out to meet them in Tabuk, didn't encounter them, and then just retreated back because they didn't find any Roman army invading them. The, the question that was coming in the minds of Muslims were, why do Romans hate us, or why wouldn't, why wouldn't they not like us? I mean, we were morally supporting them. What, what's going on? Why aren't they, why aren't they viewing us as uh, something benign? Why are they having this antipathy? So when you had an emissary who's executed, which you, you, you just don't do that in the ancient world, or even the medieval world, you don't, or even any world, you don't execute emissaries. And this hostility, we see that the verse says, those, fight those who do not believe in God or the last day. Now, it wouldn't make sense if, if that was meant in, the, in the, what you might see from a non-Semitic perspective, just say, oh, well, you know, fight those who don't believe in God on the last day, but Christians believe in God on the last day, and Jews believe in God on the last day, so that doesn't make any sense. But whenever we've seen this discussion, fight those who do not believe in God on the last day, it's always been if someone has demonstrated by breaking the commandments of their own religion, by being immoral, that they don't truly believe in God and the last day. And we see this from the narration of the Prophet Muhammad, was be used as a refrain, those, or an imprecation, those people don't believe in God's last day, those people who've done this, they clearly don't believe in God's last day. So this is what this, this, front, this first verse is, is, is starting and saying. But let's read beyond the next verse. I know you quote the next verse. Let's read beyond this. And it says, and it continues, so okay, may God destroy them how they are deluded, it does say this, and I, again, that probably wouldn't be any, any it, well, the literal meaning is, um, may God fight them, and I suppose, as a Calvinist, you believe that all humans are in a rebellious nature against God, fighting against God, and it was not meaning that humans are fighting them, it's saying God fights them, who do what we consider in Islam to be, you know, blasph we'll say blasphemous uh, concepts, and the, the translation usually the Jews say or Ezra, it, I want to leave it as Uzair because it might not necessarily translate as Ezra, it could be Enoch, it could be a whole number of different um, uh, individuals. However, the very next verse it says, they have taken their scholars and monks as lords besides God and also the Messiah and son of Mary. And they were not commanded except to worship one God, there is no deity except him. Exalted is he above whatever they associate with him. They want to extinguish the light of God with their mouths, but God refuses to accept, ex refuses to accept to perfect this light, his light, although the disbelievers dislike it. O oh, you who have believed, indeed many of the scholars and the monks devour the wealth of people unjustly and avert them from the way of God. Those who hoard gold and silver and spend it not in the way of God give them tidings of a painful punishment. Now, this sounds to me like Calvin's Institutes of Religion against the Catholic Church. Because this, this is exactly what he says about the Catholic Church. They become corrupt. They hoard wealth. They avert people from, the, from righteousness. They avert people from knowing the truth. And he, he doesn't have some pleasant words to say about the, the Catholic Church. And in this particular period of time, it was the Eastern Roman Empire that was doing these very corrupt practices. And the reason, and I, to back this up, that it's not uh, general to every single Christian, I'll bring a narration by the Prophet Muhammad himself. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, commanded the Muslims uh, that when, once, when they encounter these empires and, and they encounter all these issues and, and their political diplomacy of other nations, he says, leave the Abyssinians alone as long as they leave you alone and leave the Turks alone as long as they leave you alone. The Turks are pagans. At, that, at this point in time, they were pagans. And the Abyssinians were Christians. But what we see from the, the discussion of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, about the Abyssinians were that they were a just Christian nation. And so they were not to have any, Muslims were not to have any hostility with Abyssinians because they were just. And it was affirmed so, and hence this was a prohibition by the Prophet Muhammad of which was adhered to for at least 1,000 years after the Prophet Muhammad. There was no wars between Muslims and Abyssinians. That only changed because some Abyssinians converted to Islam and they wanted to have a revolution as a long story. <laughs> but that was still an internal matter, not an external matter. So that's how, that's the context behind that. Okay, let, let, me, let me put this into a context that uh, is uncomfortable but necessary. Sure. Um, there is an online uh, magazine published by ISIS, and they utilize this text as a basis for their killing of Christians, and here's the idea. And here's, here's, here's what's uncomfortable is 
uh, you say, okay, this isn't all Christians. The, the, the putting together in such a close, um, uh, intimate fashion of specific Christian statements, the Messiah is the son of a law. So here you have the idea, all Christians believe that Jesus is the son of God. That's definitional of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, called disbelievers, uh, how are they deluded? I think that's the same word that's used in Surahs 4 and 5 when they say three. I could be wrong about that, but I think I'm correct about that. And then when it says, uh, they have taken their scholars and monks as lawyers beside Allah, and also the Messiah, son of Mary, again the idea of the exaltation of Jesus, immediately followed by, and they were not commanded except to worship one God which in all of those texts of Surah 4 and 5, where Christianity is specifically in sight, the response to saying three is always what? There is only one God, Allah. So why is there such a theological element here? ISIS uses this as their, various, their very foundation for saying this is why we've done what we've done to these Christian people. I know that there are texts where, the, the, I know about the, the delegation from Najran, I, I get all of that. Why is, the, why is the theological beliefs of Christians intimately connected at this point if, if the distinction's being made? That's what we need to understand. Okay. Well, first of all, I call this um, Godwin, Godwin's second law. The first law is that as a debate progresses, the probability of um, Nantes being used or raised will we approach oh, one. I'd the second clause would be ISIS when it comes to Islamic discussions, the probability approaches one as a, a discussion progresses. Not, not meant to be a gotcha. <laughs> I just happened to, they, they put out an article yep. that was, it was one of the most theologically laden articles I've ever seen. And I want to know, how do you refute that argumentation? Well, that helps us. Well, let's, okay. Well, here's the thing, I've engaged ISIS supporters on Twitter a lot in, in Twitter debates and so on. And I haven't really seen them bring this up as an argument to kill Christians. What I have seen them bring up and what they usually bring up is they usually bring up a very typical um, argument which Osama bin Laden brought up, which is fight, fight them as they fight you. Whereby he argues that because the United States bombs them, that mm -hmm. they should be allowed to return that back to the United States in kind. And because the United States bombed them without regard to civilian life, they should return that in kind. And again, that, but if they only to, were to continue reading, but do not transgress the limits of God. That's what the verse says. That's their argument. But ISIS's enemies currently are Kurds in North Syria, uh, other rebels who are Islamic, uh, the Iraqi forces in Iraq, Turkey. There's really no Christian states that they are conquering at the moment. So this verse doesn't really apply anyway. And even in that verse, it doesn't say kill Christians who say this, kill Christians who say uh, whether the, Jesus is God or what have you. No, it didn't say this at all. And in fact, it starts with the premise, fight those who do not believe in God on the last day um, from amongst the people of the book, which wouldn't make any sense if you want to take it absolutely literally because Christians believe in God on the last day. So it clearly means that those Christians who don't care about the limits of God and really don't care about God on the last day, don't, ones who are not in their hearts true believers in God on the last day because they commit wanton corruption and they break the laws, and this is clearly what it's referring to. And even in that circumstance, and, and even if we want to take the most aggressive interpretation of that verse that you, that you can, it's not, again, it still doesn't say kill them. It says fight them until, uh, what, they pay jizya, what, they become citizens? That's, jizya is basically a citizenship tax, uh, akin to Jacques Rousseau's idea of the contract citizen. So what, fight them until they become citizens? That's not really a blank check to fight people and kill them because of their ideas. Because Christians are, were tolerated, were accepted during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and afterwards under Islamic law. There is no law, no in, in opinion that says that Christians have to be killed because they say that Jesus is God. The, the phrase, may Allah destroy them after calling them disbelievers who confess that uh, Jesus, the Messiah, is the Son of God. But not um, humans destroy them. Okay, and so that is, may, and that, there, is a, there is a difference, and it is only... It's a theological concept. It's a, it's, it's a theological, it's, called, it's clearly a theological concept, because whenever we say, uh, may God fight or may God destroy, it, will, it can only be God destroys with his punishment in the hereafter, or God may ordain a punishment of his own choosing in this life, but he brings about it for his own means whether floods, earthquakes, or what have you. Is there any conceivable context in which 
Surah 9, 29, and 30, and 31, I guess, the whole section. Is there any conceivable context in which that could be made applicable in a modern situation, in your opinion? Well, the thing is that, again, uh, there is no idea in this verse that Christians should be killed because they, they pr pr you know, pronounce these beliefs or they have a particular concept or idea. It doesn't say that at all. Um, in fact, I've often gone on record as touting with pride the uh, Islamic history's uh, long precedent of tolerance to Christians, precedent of tolerance to Jews, because uh, we could coexist. It was about not forcing people to become Muslim, but rather uh, presenting them with the choice, presenting them with the message. And that was the whole point of Islam, is to present the whole world with a choice to become Muslim or not, to embrace Islam, to see guidance, or choose to turn away from guidance. That's, that's why God gave us free will, and it's why God gave us, uh, why God didn't make every, the whole world in one religion, as the other verses in the Quran say. One minute. So what I would say is that um, I, I have never actually encountered an ISIS argument where they've cited that verse as a justification for killing Christians. The only argument they've ever brought is that they say the Quran allows them to copy United States of America. That's what they argue generally. And this argument that's un-Islamic goes against all classical scholarship because you can't target civilians in warfare. There is not even any difference of opinion on this matter about targeting civilians with any of, of 1,400 of, of Islamic scholarship. ISIS are very much, unfortunately, a very nasty modern phenomena and not a phenomena of Islamic scholarship or texts. Thank you. Five minutes, Mr. Andalusi, to summarize your uh, views on this segment of the discussion. Sure. Now, I'd like to kind of uh, iterate something from a classical scholarship and not myself. Now, generally, two scholars which for some reason, seem, was cited by Osama bin Laden himself, Ibn Taymiyyah, a classical Islamic scholar, and Ibn al-Qayyim. Now, he was cited, these two scholars were cited by Osama bin Laden himself in these discussions to justify his wars against America. But here's the strange thing, and this is the thing that baffles us, it baffles Muslims who know about scholarship, is that these scholars simply do not say anything that supports Osama bin Laden or ISIS. For example, Ibn Taymiyyah says in his book, Qaida fil Qital al Kufar, he says, the Prophet's biography shows that he did not fight whoever made peace with him among the unbelievers. And the books of biography, prophetic traditions, exegesis, jurisprudence, and history are full of, of, of such acts. And this is widely narrated in his biography. Thus, the Prophet did not initiate fighting with anyone and had God commanded him to fight every disbeliever, then he would have initiated fighting them. Ibn al-Qaim says in his Hidayat al-Hayara, he says, the Prophet never forced religion upon anyone, but rather he only fought those who waged war against him and fought him. As for those who made peace with him or conducted a truce, then he never fought them and he never compelled them to enter his religion. As his Lord, the Almighty has commanded him, there is no compulsion in religion, for right guidance is distinct from error. The negation in this verse carries the meaning of prohibition, namely, you may not force your religion on anyone. So these are what the classical scholars, not me, not any modern day Muslim scholar, classical medieval Islamic scholars have said about this matter. But I'd like to apprise you of something you might not realize. Al Jazeera had an interview with Osama bin Laden, I think it was 2002 or 2001, and they asked him about his terror campaign against the United States of America and his war against American civilians. And they asked him, you know, how do you justify this? How do you justify this when in Islam it's prohibited to kill civilians? And you know what he says? He says, you're right. In Islam it is prohibited to kill civilians. It has been related in authentic traditions by the Prophet Muhammad and by the scholars that you're not allowed to kill uh, women, children, non-combatants. So the Al Jazeera journalist is completely perplexed and says, well, exactly. So then how do you justify it then? And here's what Osama bin Laden's response was. Well, the law isn't set in stone, he says. That's his argument. And then he brings a verse in the Quran which says, 
Fight them as they fight you. And his argument is, if they, fight, if they bomb our civilians, we shouldn't be shy to do the same back to them to stop them from bombing our civilians. And he cites defensive verses in the Quran. He views his war as a defensive war against imperialist aggression. His entire idea is wrong by his own admission. He himself negates the commands. He says they're not set in stone. Well, excuse me, as a Muslim, I believe they are set in stone, so to speak. And they don't change, depending on convenience. And, in, and instead, his example isn't the Prophet Muhammad, but instead he talks about World War II when they bombed German cities, or Hiroshima, Nagasaki. He starts citing these examples as his model to emulate. He emulates British military history, American military history, but not the Prophet's military history. So when people usually ask, what do you say to ISIS about these Quranic arguments? They don't bring Quranic arguments. And they are very, not even selective, they just don't bring it. They, they always argue, instead they say, well, look at what America's done to our civilians. Look at what Britain's done to our civilians. That's their argument. That's the argument I've only heard from them. And again, the only verse of the Quran is, fight them as they fight you, and they always just cut off that last bit about, but do not transgress the limits of God. God loves not the transgressors. There quite literally is, in 1400 years of Islamic uh, jurisprudence, there is not one single opinion that allows the deliberate targeting of civilians. And if ISIS say that that's allowable, that that's now suddenly permitted, or halal in Arabic, then this makes them worse than heretics in Islam. But ISIS will never care, don't really care about religion, just like a, a, and the anti balaka movement in Congo don't really care about Christianity. But because it's part of their identity, they cite it, they couch their actions with these uh, narrations and verses in order to make them sound justified to their people because they live in religious environments. But they, their motivations do not stem from the Quran, just like the anti balaka movement do not stem from the Bible. Thank you. Many, many years ago, Augustine gave in to the pressure to utilize military force to suppress a movement called the Donatists. And one of the verses that was utilized was from a parable where Jesus talked about going out and compelling them to come in to the wedding feast. And he understood this as substantiating the idea that you could use governmental force to keep people within uh, the orthodox faith. We recognize that that was not only a misuse of that text, but unbeknownst to him would a thousand years later result in something called the Inquisition. And so we see what can happen with developments. We can see what can happen when a text of scripture is taken out of its context and you do not have a consistent method of exegesis to rein in that error. Now, I immediately, I hope you saw, went to one of the key texts that you will find if you look at almost anything that's written on the subject of jihad today, on the subject of Islam and warfare. Surah 9, considered by most to be the last surah revealed, and hence it would abrogate anything that came before it. That particular verse is why I focused upon that, because we need to understand how there are differences of understanding amongst Muslims on this text and what the classical scholars said. Islam created a high civilization that could not have existed if there had not been limitations on what jihad could and could not be and what conditions would bring it about. Here is the question that I, as a Christian, have. The methodology of interpretation that I presented to you in regards to the Bible's verses of uh, violence is consistent between the Old and New Testaments. Given the type of sources, you'll notice that, for example, Abdullah quoted from two primary sources. He quoted from the Quran, and he quoted a few times from various hadith, from Sahih al-Bakari, Muslim, uh, I think I saw Jamia Termidi, I may, may have seen Sunan Abu Dawood at one point. Now, here's the question, and here has been my concern for many years now, and some of the Muslims in the, in the audience that listen to my program know this has been one of my concerns. 
are those sources themselves consistent enough for one side to be able to vanquish the other in the debate that is taking place within Islam today? I remember very clearly a, uh, a cleric from somewhere in Central Africa crowing because he had found a hadith that he interpreted as allowing uh, the destruction of innocent people uh, in warfare. I happened to remember that hadith, having read that collection myself, and I knew that the two preceding or two following hadith specifically prohibited the killing of women and children, and yet he had just chosen the one. The consistency of interpretation, the methodology of interpretation that is utilized, this is the issue. Are the sources from which we are drawing these arguments consistent enough to banish the abuse of these texts. Now, don't get me wrong. I see people abusing the Bible all the time. I see people misusing the Bible all the time. You cannot stop people from abusing truths. But the issue that lies before us this evening is those who promote violence in the name of Islam have their argumentation. I personally wish that I would see more dialogue and debate, not on Twitter, 140 characters is not long enough to get very, get, get very far, but I'd like to see something similar to this happening between someone who holds the classical position that Abdullah has enunciated and someone who would dare step forward and say, I will defend the position that is being presented by these groups like Boko Haram or Al-Qaeda uh, or, uh, uh, or ISIS today. I'd like to see that kind of exchange taking place. Unfortunately, one side prefers violence uh, to reasoning at that particular point in time. But the issue for us tonight, the consistency of interpretation between the two sides, the utilization of these texts, hopefully it's been helpful for you to hear how that exchange takes place. It certainly has been for me. Thank you. It is normally my, uh, my uh, tradition uh, to give a little something, it normally has to be a little something because I have to drag it all across the world, but a little something to the person with whom I'm dialoguing. This is going to be a strange book to give to a Muslim. But I love to listen to Muslims talking to Muslims. It helps me to understand what you all really believe. And so this is a book that I wrote to Christians. Uh, it's called Pulpit Crimes, The Criminal Mishandling of God's Word. And it's where I'm dealing with issues within our community. So I thought, you know what? If I find discussions where you all are talking to your community to be enlightening to me, maybe the other, other direction around. So I'd like to give you uh, this book. The issue this evening is war and peace are texts that address these particular subjects. Once again, this isn't an entertaining exchange. This is an exchange that requires you to listen carefully, to weigh, to be willing to learn, to consider new perspectives. But I do want to suggest this. Fundamentally, peace is something that exists between the creator and his creation. Peace is something that we experience individually between ourselves and God. When I'm at peace with God, I have a foundation for being at peace with those around me. When I am fundamentally at war with my God, then I cannot have a foundation to be at peace with those around me. We all know that how this works within our own personal lives, with our own, within marriage. When I am in rebellion, when I'm not doing what is right before God, my relationship with my wife, my children, suffers. When I'm not right with God, my relationship with those around me suffers. And so for me, we can talk about the big picture, but I'm a grandfather now. I just saw a picture of my darling uh, little four-year-old granddaughter, Clementine, in, I, I think she lives in princess dresses, personally, um, <laughs> which is beautiful. And when I think about the future, I now think about her. And I want peace in this world. I want her to be able to grow up and be the, the mommy she wants to be and to have her children and to have a loving husband and to have a stable home and, and to have the op those types of opportunities. I want to see peace. And so it has become much more important to me 
to be able to emphasize, to have to emphasize, that from the Christian perspective, fundamentally, God has provided for peace with himself. And he's done so in an amazing fashion, in an amazing way. When we talk about our texts of war and peace, it comes back for me to how I have peace with God. When I wake up in the morning, knowing my own heart, knowing all the duties that I left undone the day before, knowing the sins that I committed the day before of thought and deed, how can I claim to have peace with God? What kind of arrogance is it for me to think that I have peace with the thrice holy God, the God who is surrounded by angels who say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Knowing how unclean I am, how can I say I have peace? Well, that's a terrible problem. But God has provided an amazing solution. I believe that what the world needs to hear is that we can have peace with him because he has taken the initiative. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together have chosen to bring about this thing called the gospel. My Lord and Savior gave himself voluntarily. His life was not taken from him. He laid it down of his own accord. He voluntarily laid his life down so that my sins can be imputed to him, his righteousness imputed to me, so that when I stand before a holy God, I do not stand in the good works that I have done because I know that even the good works I have done are stained with selfishness, ignorance, self-conceit. Instead, I stand robed in the righteousness of another, a perfect righteousness that avails before that thrice holy God. And that is the only reason I have peace with God. The only reason I can stand in his presence. This evening, I mentioned at the beginning that Abdullah and I are not trying to hide our differences. And our fundamental differences have to do with who God is and how we are to have a right relationship with him. It is my deepest desire that every person on this planet, including every Muslim, know the peace that I know because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. I want them to hear my heart. I want them to know that I love them, I care for them. I am thankful for men like Abdullah al-Andalusi who are willing to stand up and say, no, that's not what I believe. This is why I believe what I believe. I stand against that. I am thankful for that. And he knows that my deepest desire for him is that he would understand the peace that I have and share it as well. That's why we have these dialogues. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Seven minutes to bring your personal perspectives on. I'd like to reiterate my humble and sincere thanks to everyone here who turned up to listen to both sides of this discussion, those who opened their ears and opened their hearts to different perspectives and were willing to give latitude to people who they might have disagreements in some areas and agreements in other areas. You know, I think certainly between Christians and Muslims, I always like to go, sometimes, I like to go, I like to go Old Testament, <laughs> but not necessarily to um, any of the verses uh, uh, concerning the nations and in the land of Canaan, but to the Old Testament's discussion on peace, which I think is something that could be a commonality between us. We see that it says in Leviticus, and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. And I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And this was quite interesting. And there's another verse which says, If you do this, and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all those people will go home satisfied, bishalom, which is in peace. And I think that's very important. And I think that while we have to look inwards 
and remember God and come to peace with God in ourselves, we also have to realize and remember that God made us in this life for a purpose, for a reason. All the evils in the world that we see, all the injustice and the oppression, we should always ask ourselves the question, why do they exist? Why do they exist? And I, was, I saw a very interesting uh, line uh, in an, an article someone wrote, where someone said, I was going to ask God, why did he create all this suffering and persecution and injustice? Why does he allow it to, go, to continue? But I was scared he'd ask me the, the same question back. <laughs> and I think this is where we should think about. Um, Islam didn't just view itself as a personal and private project for justice and peace, but rather it viewed itself as a global project for justice and peace, much like how Zion is described in the Old Testament as a place where all nations will come and will be at peace and will judge by uh, the, the, the justice of Zion. And I think this is something that we have to strive. You might not believe in Islam, but as Christians, you should strive to see justice in this world because only through justice can our hearts be relaxed and we be at peace in the land as we believe the Old Testament has said. But also, we have to also consider that Muslims and Christians, we might have our differences and we are very open about these differences. And in fact, we have public debates. Me and James have had a few public debates. James had a number of debates with other Muslims. And it doesn't mean that we have to now hate each other because we differ. It doesn't mean that we have to be unjust to each other because we differ. But rather, while accepting our differences, we should recognize that we can cooperate in a lot of good against a lot of common challenges. A lot of the intolerance against religion, which is rising in, in Western countries now, throughout the world, is not only targeting Christians, so targeting Muslims too, it's targeting uh, religious Jews, the Jewish community in the UK has faced issues, with rising militant secularism. We, as Muslims and Christians, we have common cause to protect our values, the right to openly profess our beliefs, to carry crosses in public, to wear hijabs in public. These are issues that we have to deal with, to not be fired from your employment just because you wear a cross or because you have a hijab or because you have a beard or what have you, although people say hipsters, obviously, I've, <laughs> I've taken that now. <laughs> They've taken it from us, unfortunately. <laughs> So, so what I say is this, the Quran says, let us come to a common word to, between Muslims and Christians, that we should worship none other but the Lord our God. But I also say this, let us come to a common agreement that we shall both together be witnesses for justice to help mankind because God intended we exist in this life, not just so we isolate ourselves and try to make ourselves right with him, but rather we make ourselves right with him by manifesting good deeds or by doing good deeds, depending on your theological position. We prove our righteous, we prove that we are right with God by our deeds. At the very least, we can all commonly agree on that. And I think that we should see more of this discussion, I should see more of this debate where we openly air our differences, but very importantly, we should also openly air how we can work together and how we can create peace if not between us and God, but also throughout the land. Thank you. I just have one last thing, as is, as is customary. Um, I decided to uh, get James White actually a few books, but unfortunately um, Amazon has conspired to prevent me them being delivered to my address in time. So for the time being, I want to present him with a book called The Quran with References to the Bible, where you have a Quran that has different verses in it, and each verse is cross-referenced with a biblical verse. You might find this intriguing and understanding. I know I did. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. For, for, just for the next debate, whilst presents have been handed out, let nobody forget the moderator of the debate next time. <laughs> Um, we're, 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 going, we're going to have a, a question and answer session. 
And um, if we try to keep the answers short, thankfully members of the audience have submitted the questions and many of the questions are very similar, so we're going to present the questions which seem to be very common from, from most members of the audience. Uh, you'll have three minutes uh, if the question is directed to you and one minute to respond after that. Um, and my first question is to Professor White. The question is, is religious freedom a biblical concept? Is religious freedom a biblical concept? Wow. Well, yes, I would say in the sense that um, Christians should not be involved in seeking to specifically restrict the freedoms of others. Uh, but Christianity was birthed under the Roman Empire where until 313 AD, uh, Christianity was called a religio illicita, an illicit or illegal religion. And so um, they weren't given that kind of freedom until many centuries down the road. And so Christianity is supposed to be able to exist under any situation. We, like I said, we have brothers and sisters in North Korea today, which is an amazing thing to consider. But it seems that the question may be asking, when Christians are in the majority, should, uh, should freedom of religion be offered to others? And obviously, if you believe that the only mechanism whereby a person is actually brought to faith in Christ is through the preaching of the gospel and through the ministration of the Spirit of God, then how could you restrict uh, someone else's uh, engagement in their own religious beliefs. Um, there are Christians, uh, you, you, you even used the terminology, Abdullah, uh, of theonomy. Theonomy is simply the, the rule of God's law. But there are Christians that believe that you should create a Christian culture similar to the theocratic nation of Israel. Uh, and of course, in Israel, you could not and did not have religious freedom. Uh, you are not allowed to worship other gods or, or anything like that. Um, and so there are some people who do believe that that should be established within a majority Christian nation. Uh, I'm not sure how that works under the New Covenant. And I have some serious problems. I have a high view of God's law. And I believe every nation should look to God's law for guidance as to what justice is. But the question becomes, where do you bring in penology? Where do you bring in punishment? Are you trying to establish a theocracy or something along those lines? I see nothing in the New Testament that says that that's to be our goal. And, uh, but I have friends who would obviously disagree at that point. Uh, and we have our, our exchanges. So uh, I, I see nothing in the New Testament that demands that we establish a particular kind of governmental system that would then restrict the religious beliefs of others. Thank you. Views from you? Um, I would just say that it's an interesting question whether there's uh, freedom of religion or the right to profess your belief as you see fit is a, a construct of any particular religion. Uh, one could argue the Roman Empire didn't care, or the Roman Republic rather, didn't care what religion you were as long as you uh, burned a bit of incense to the emperor, right. and then they didn't care what you believed in personally. Uh, and I, see, I feel that today's world, the, the, the burning a pinch of incense has been replaced with uh, nationalism, perhaps, with uh, being uh, adhering, or minorities having to be forced to adhere to particular national values as viewed as being loyal or not. And Christians were suspected of being disloyal to the Roman Empire because they refused to uh, burn that, uh, that pinch of incense. So uh, it's an interesting question. One could argue, some people argue John Locke, who, who is a Christian, pioneered the idea. Some could say that you had uh, plurality of religions in, in Islamic lands. So it's an interesting question, much more than one minute can cover, but it's something that would be worth um, investigating to have a look. But I think, the, I, I mean, all those civilizations in the past had plurality of religions before. It wasn't invented in the West, at, at the very least, anyway. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Andalusi, your first question, would you say that countries like Saudi Arabia and Malaysia are uh, on Islamic due to their harsh treatment of Christians and Jewish citizens in those nations? Okay, so do I say that Malaysia and Indonesia are Islamic governments? Uh, right off the bat, no. And you can, and it's not just me making the claim, you can see for yourself. Let's, let's take the Quran, for example. It says the Quran usury is prohibited, and I don't know what the uh, Christian perspective on usury is, um, or at least particular Protestant perspectives, but in the Quran, usury or interest banking is prohibited. But 
And not only the Quran says that, but the Quran also it says, take notice of war from God and his messenger to those who deal in usury. Again, it's a theological threat, not to one necessarily that will be carried out by, by fighting. But in Saudi Arabia, I was reading just recently, BBC was reporting that Saudi Arabia raised interest rates to control, um, obviously, the, the, the currency value. And I was thinking, well, that should just by itself tell you whether Saudi Arabia really cares about Islam or not. The Quran says, take notice of war from Allah and his messenger, God and his messenger, to those who deal with usury or interest. And Saudi Arabia has interest banking system. So does Malaysia, so does Iran, so does Egypt, so does Turkey, all these countries. And that's just off the bat. Also, you can't have an unlimited leader, a leader that has, is the supreme, supreme sovereign of a government. God is a supreme sovereign, and any leader is restricted by the Sharia, but by Islamic law. So you, couldn't, you can't have an unlimited leader, you can't have kingship in Islam, and yet you see it there. So short answer is Saudi Arabia isn't an Islamic government. Um, however, as Muslims, we are trying to campaign to uh, make Muslims more aware about what Islamic law says, the rights for non-Muslims, rights for Muslims as well. It's, it's actually Muslims as well that are being denied their rights in many of these countries. And we're seeing this. I mean, in Malaysia, for example, uh, again, certainly not a perfect country by any measure, but uh, in certain religious obligations, non-Muslims are exempt. So non during the time of Ramadan, obviously, Christians aren't expected to fast. And they, are, in so many cases, are, can even eat publicly, and, it, and, it's, and it's fine. And these are just a few aspects of Islam. The rest, obviously, is not obviously Islamic law. But as Muslims, we're trying to strive our hardest to revive uh, Islamic civilization, uh, to reverse it from its post-colonial condition at the moment, where most Muslims are ignorant about Islamic law. Most Muslims wouldn't know what the Quran said about a number of these of legal topics. And so it's, we are striving as Muslims to try to educate Muslims as to what Islamic law even says at the get-go, and that is where the Muslim work is, is trying to revive a civilization. Unfortunately, uh, the opponent to this is not Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism, it's uh, secular liberalism, which is also sp uh, spreading through our lands. The elites in all these countries are notably secular liberal, even Saudi Arabia, notably they are secular, and they are thank very disdainful of religious law. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, I, I'm going to have to stop you there. I'm going to try to get through as many of these right. questions as right. possible. So James, if you would um, take one minute in response uh, to that. I'll, I'll take even less than that. I just simply would really encourage my Muslim friends to join with us in, um, in condemning uh, those incidents, and there are many, where Christians are persecuted in Muslim lands. We need to hear uh, very loudly uh, our uh, uh, Muslim friends in our country saying that what's happening to Christians in many countries where they're not only marginalized but are, are being killed uh, is, is wrong even from their perspective. We want to hear that even more loudly than we have in the past. Thank you. Uh, Abdullah, let me come to you with this question. Separation of church and state has existed for hundreds of years in the Christian world. Do you think that separation can exist in the Islamic world, the separation of state and religion? Well, I don't actually think that separation of church and state has actually been consistent throughout Christendom. Obviously, we can cite the Catholic Church. I don't need to go that far. I can cite modern day Britain. The head of state is also the head of the church, head of the Anglican Church, which is the Queen of England. So technically, this country isn't fully secular. It's actually a, well, I wouldn't say a theocracy, but uh, I don't think uh, the Queen issues fatwas anymore, but uh, it's certainly you have bishops in the House of Lords and so on and so forth. So the idea of separation of church and state is a matter of, let's say, historical Christian difference of opinion, or ikhtilaf, as we say in Arabic, difference of opinion. And in Islam, we don't have an idea of a church as the Christians understand the term. I think the best translation for church is usually jama' in Arabic, which means a congregation. But the congregation are both the uh, former citizens of, of, the, of a state, and the state, the leaders, are from that same congregation. So therefore, there wouldn't be a separation because the congregation of believers are the people who form the citizens of a state. And so how could there be a separation? And, uh, the difference from the, let's say, Christian history is that in Islam, a, in a, a, the Islamic system, a caliphate, the caliph doesn't have the right to impose theological opinions upon the populace. At least precedent showed that. There was a, a brief stint with some individuals called the Mutazalites who, uh, who wanted to impose their theological opinions. But generally, 
the caliph is not like a pope. He's only a political leader, and he only rules according to the, the political aspects of Islamic law, but does not mandate positions of theology and enforce those positions of theology upon Muslims. So our understanding of church and state is completely different because we don't have a church, and state doesn't necessarily interfere with theology, but state is here to apply uh, law. Thank you. James? Um, I, I, I just commented uh, briefly uh, upon that uh, just a few moments ago, so uh, I would just, it does seem to me that uh, it's in, in Islam it is impossible to separate Sharia from, from the faith, so the question would be what kind of law, and that's what, what Abdul was talking about uh, earlier. Uh, obviously, from my perspective, historically, when you look back, um, one of the greatest blights on the Christian faith was when the state and the church were one. That was one of the lowest points when it comes to the spirituality um, uh, and the behavior and the doctrine of what called itself the Christian church. Um, we need to recognize that the gospel is to transcend all of those boundaries. And uh, unfortunately in history, we haven't always followed that, that rule. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions at least. So let, let's quickly take this one uh, to you, um, Professor White. As a Christian, if I defend myself militarily from an oppressive group, is this wrong? When you d d d say, as a Christian, if I defend myself militarily? That's what the question says. Uh, and it goes on to say, because a lot of Christians live and are killed uh, and remain passive even, even then? Well, it, it, if the question is asking, is it wrong to serve in the military uh, in a just war, then no, I would say that, that biblically, uh, uh, Jesus encountered soldiers and, and what he, what, when they asked what they should do, he said, only take your pay and, and do no wrong. So uh, I don't think there's anything wrong in serving in the military. I, I, think, I think the question is suggesting that if you uh, take up arms to defend yourself in an oppressive regime. What, what well, are the it sounds like revolution at that point, revolution against an unjust cause or something like that, taking up arms. Uh, that's, that's a whole other issue. Uh, certainly, the United States began in that way. Uh, the, the question, and there were certainly many Christians who took leadership in that situation. Um, the problem, in, in my experience, is it's far too easy to create theological reasons for what are actually political reasons. Uh, and we need to be very careful as Christians at that point uh, that, we, that we don't utilize uh, religion as a cover for our political perspectives. I'm, not, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be just looking at you. You didn't ask the question. Whoever it was, um, I, I think clearly that there are situations where you have such an oppressive government um, that... Uh, the, the needs of the people are being trampled underfoot. Um, is, that, is that a proper situation? There's, a, there's differences of opinion there because certainly Rome, the Roman Empire was extremely unjust and during those periods of persecution, should the, should the Christians have risen up in armed rebellion? Um, they didn't and they didn't believe that they had the right to do that. I sometimes read to my church history class a letter of Cyprian to the miners, the Christian miners who were condemned to work in mines and they almost always died in those contexts. Um, it's amazing, it, it, look it up sometime, it's, 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 it's easy to find. They had a tremendous witness because they didn't opt for the military option. Uh, I think it would be the last resort, um, I really do, for a Christian. Thank you, thank you. Do you want to respond to that? Oh, just very briefly. Again, the, historically there has been different Christian opinions on this. I think Thomas Aquinas actually made an argument for if a leader became unjust to a certain point, then the, the leader had dissolved the bonds of leadership from the people and the people then can uh, rise up against uh, the, uh, that oppressor. That's Thomas Aquinas. Um, so I can't really argue from a, from a Christian perspective. Uh, from an Islamic perspective, the, it's not really the argument. There's a lot of safeties that have to be safe kind of uh, protocols that have to be met first and which is quite high and it's generally to the point that if a leader ceases ruling by um, Islamic law and this is in a Muslim society not in a non-Muslim society of course uh, then there could be discussions on that of course many scholars have said but if there's a lot of bloodshed that's going to come from this if it's going to cause a lot of turmoil then uh, you shouldn't basically undertake that 
So you have to make a, an assessment of whether it's going to be done quickly, a quick bloodless coup, or is it going to, learn, to turn into a long, drawn-out war? The classical scholars have been uh, difficult on that, and I think you will find similar differences amongst Christians. Thank you. James? That, that was That's, his response to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, one, one more question. Um, in your view... Um, Who is it addressed to? Uh, th this is addressed to you first, um, but, but it's a question to both of you, in, in fact. Um, what is the greatest commandment um, in Islam and Christianity? Oh, fascinating. Um, the greatest commandment in Christianity, according to our Lord and Savior, is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's his, his answer. And obviously, from my perspective, if that's the greatest commandment, we're all in a lot of trouble. Uh, because um, I've never fulfilled that. I don't have the capacity to fulfill that. Even when I think I've fulfilled it for a while, all of a sudden I discover that I'm proud of having fulfilled it, which means I didn't love God perfectly. <laughs> and this is the situation we find ourselves, and this is where, where there's a difference between us, because. Uh, we believe that man is in a fallen state, and in the fallen state, the Bible describes us as being at enmity with God, and according to Romans chapter 8, the mind set on the flesh is not able to do what's pleasing to God. And that's why I said what I said in my closing statement. My only hope, knowing my heart, is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. I need a mediator. I need his righteousness. I need what only he can do for me three minutes this time? Well, again, I would go, I'm going to go Old Testament here, uh, which is uh, the first commandment that you know, the, the, the people of Israel were to only worship the Lord their God and take no uh, idols beside him, no uh, false deities beside him, which is reiterated in Islam, that we shall worship only the Lord our God and not associate partners to him. And that's very important because it's not a very a simple formula as you might imagine, because there are all kinds of idols that people take. People might take their country as an idol, their patriotism rising to the level of idolatry. They might take their parents or their see, celebrities or their football teams, celebrities, as idols in a way. If ever they choose anything other than God in any of their day-to-day -day decisions, this is, to some extent, choosing other than God, to, choosing to worship other than God. And it's very important. So I wouldn't say committing sins means idolatry, but what I would say is that the basis of worshiping one God exclusively with your heart, body, and soul, your living and your dying, all for the worship of God, as the Quran says, this is the basis upon which all other pillars are built, all other righteousness are built, and the very purpose of, of human existence, that why God made us in the first place was to worship him and him alone.